Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this afternoon's presentation. Uh, hopefully you intended to sign up for the Life of Lichen. I'm James Stevenson. I work for the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences here in Pinellas County and coming to you from Brooker Creek Preserve. If you haven't visited Brooker Creek Preserve up here in the north of the county, it's definitely worth a visit and a good place to observe this interesting group of organisms that we'll be examining today. Visitors come to Brooker Creek. Many want to know what's the pink stuff on the trees. Well, the pink stuff on the trees, along with lots of other things on the trees and on other surfaces, is lichen. What is lichen? First we say that's lichen, then we get what is it? Well, lichen, you might have heard, is a combination of things. It's most people, if they're familiar with lichen, know that there's something to do with fungus, that lichen has something maybe to do with fungus. And maybe you're even aware that lichen has something to do with fungus and algae. Maybe it's a combination of the two. Indeed, it can be. Algae, through photosynthesis, can produce sugar. It's the magic of plants. Uh, algae, green algae, is a true plant. Sometimes, though, oftentimes, it's not just fungus and algae. It could be fungus and bacteria. There are certain photosynthetic bacteria. We're not talking about plants. We're talking about bacteria photosynthetic. Most of our oxygen in the world comes from photosynthetic bacteria. So it's out there and it has found itself locked into these organisms that we call lichen. Bacteria through photosynthesis, photosynthesis of course, can produce sugar, glucose, but bacteria can often um, take atmospheric nitrogen and change it in such a way to make it available as a nutrient uh, to other organisms, to plants, fungus, and animals. Sometimes a lichen is all three of these things all combined together, all mixed up. So lichen, yes, has something to do with fungus, but just as importantly has to do with plants in the form of these green plants, this green algae, and bacteria in the form of these photosynthetic bacteria. So three different entire kingdoms of life. All we need to do is throw um, an animal into the mix and we'd have just about everything represented in this one organism, the lichen. Let's start though by looking at the fungal component, the fungus. We've all heard of fungus. We're all familiar with mushrooms and so on. But fungus is a kingdom, just like animals belong to a kingdom. And just as there are great blue whales and ants in the animal kingdom, there are all kinds of different and diverse fungus or different fungi. In a lichen, the fungus is referred to, because this is a, an organism made of several different parts, the fungus is called the mycobiont. It's not a word that's thrown around very often, but just as an introduction to the subject today, so you know, in a lichenized organism, if you take the fungus all by itself, it is referred to as the mycobiont. And fungus, whether it's lichenized or not, or free living, as we say, fungus, fungi are, fungus is composed of these hollow tubes. You might know that fungus 
reproduce by spores. Spores are specialized single cells that when they're released into the environment, if that single cell spore finds the right place to grow, uh, that cell begins to divide and divide and divide and divide. But instead of turning into a blob like we are, like animals are, fungus in their kingdom, their spores divide and grow into these tubes, these elongated structures multinucleate, uh, cellular division, all the stuff we learned in high school, and they can branch and grow. And the way that fungus gets its nutrition is part of what makes fungus fungus. Again, I'm going to use the analogy, whales and ants being animals, animals all get their nutrition the same way. Animals, including humans, ingest and excrete. Ingest and ants do it, whales do it, animal kingdom does it. Fungus being in that kingdom, they have a way of feeding themselves that includes growing this mass of hollow tubes and secreting enzymes into the environment where they grow that break down complex carbohydrates, breaking down, decomposing, digesting their environment into simpler and simpler stuff that they can then reabsorb as nutrient. So animals eat, fungus moves through the world, dissolving it and reabsorbing it. Plants take sunlight and carbon dioxide and magic make sugar. So three different ways of being, putting things in their separate kingdoms. All of that network of tubes, those hollow tubes, those multinucleate hollow tubes that make the fungus, that's referred to as the mycelium. All the hyphal tubes referred to as this mass that you can see, it's called mycelium, and that is the fungus. The mycelium is the fungus. That's the growing, that's the feeding, that's the majority of the organism. The mycelium moving through the environment, dissolving it, and reabsorbing the nutrient. Occasionally, fungus, the fungal hyphae, change the way they grow. They stop dissolving their world and start knitting themselves together and becoming this kind of scaffolding. They become a more three-dimensional object. And for most fungus, that three-dimensional object becomes the reproductive structure, the structure that we actually can see because it comes up out of whatever it is that it's dissolving, be it leaf litter or a dead tree trunk, or in certain cases, living animal tissue, gross, but it's true. Um, sometimes the surface of a neglected piece of bread. So that hyphae knits together and makes these reproductive structures in most fungus. And here we have a toadstool. So underground is that network of mycelium. And then at certain times it knits itself together to release the spores to be the next generation. I've got a star next to this one. Uh, this reproductive structure is from one kind of fungus that lives out in the world that makes these cups. They don't make toadstools, they make cups. That's a group that I want you to keep your eyes on. 
this bread mold, uh, green penicillin, black aspergillus, uh, up close, there's those hollow tubes and the spore producing structure, so much, much simpler. The bracket fungus, the one, the, the, the types of fungus that form these cups, those are the ones that I wanted to focus on. You don't need to know this, but they're called the ascomycetes because they make ascocarps. These little cups are called ascocarps that unsurprisingly have got ascospores inside. Anyway, it's just that way that this group of fungus reproduces. The reason I wanted to call out this particular group of fungus is that for some reason, these fungi are often, they often exist in lichenized organisms. So lichen, the fungal component, the mycobiont, is very often this type of fungus that makes these cup shapes when it's time to reproduce. So talk, speaking of the mycobiont, speaking of fungus, if you were with us last week for two hours close to, no, that was bugs and butterflies. Week before we talked about the life of a dead tree and we talked all about how fungus dissolves its environment and often, if you weren't with us two weeks ago, perhaps you're just joining us and you're hearing us talk about fungus. Isn't fungus bad? Isn't, isn't fungus, and especially lichen, you know, countless times somebody might come to your door and say, you need to spray that stuff. It's fungus. It's killing your tree. It's fungus. No. The fungus that are associated in lichen, they can hardly do anything but grow. They've stopped dissolving their environment. They're not attacking anything. They can live quite happily on gravestones. So obviously they're not parasitizing a gravestone. This is a photograph of our fencing out here in the swamp. And we've got lichen and all sorts of other epiphytes growing on this plasticized metal fencing. So no, it's not bad. It's not dissolving. It's not reabsorbing. It's just existing. So yes, lichen is part fungus, but that fungus behaves in a very benign way as far as the environment is concerned. It just sits there getting its food from its photobiont. So is everybody okay with fungus? Do we need to check questions or anything? Let me see about, we've got, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, okay, we can, we can carry on. We've done the fungal component. So that's how fungus works. That's who fungus is. Let's move on to the photobionts, those things that use light to make food or sugar. We've got in lichen plants in the form of green algae and bacteria. Cyanobacteria used to be called blue green algae, same thing. So we got plants, bacteria. The plants, green algae, oftentimes a particular genus called Tribugia. Again, you don't need to know that, but just know that there is such a thing out there in the world, a green algae, a plant that takes sunlight and carbon dioxide gas, pounds them together into carbohydrates, carbon from the carbon dioxide, hydrogen from the water, sunlight makes everything happen into carbohydrates. So there is a, an algae out there in the world that often gets lichenized, which is a verb, believe it or not. Another genus that is often lichenized is actually another green plant even though it often expresses itself as gold or orange or yellow, 
in the genus in the genus Trentophilia. And we actually have that. Uh, we have all these algae living here at Brooker. And Trentophilia actually happens to be one algae that lives outside of water, often on the bark of trees. And here we have free living Trentophilia. So important to know that the Trentophilia can live free and so can the Tribugia. These can live quite happily outside of a lichen organism. If you took a lichen and took it apart and took the Tribugia out and put it in a dish, it would grow. Happy as Larry. Again, and if you took the Trentophilia out, took it out of, you know, teased it out of the lichen, put it in a dish, it would grow. If you take that uh, fungal component, the mycobiont, out of the lichen and isolated it, it would die. Cannot survive without the photobiont. Other photobiont are the bacteria. They used to be called the blue-green algae, as I mentioned. Now they're referred to as cyanobacteria, true bacteria, micro, 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 microscopic, also photosynthetic, like plants, same mechanism, turning sunlight and water and carbon dioxide into carbohydrate sugars. Nostoc is one of these blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, bacterial, uh, that can live on its own quite happily. If you took a cyanobacterian nostoc out of a lichen under the microscope and pulled it, up, washed it off, got it all isolated and put it in a dish, you'd end up with this stuff. This is actually Julia holding a little uh, coin-sized piece of this stuff called witch's butter. And this is on the surface of sandy, sandy soil. And after it rains and gets um, nice and hydrated, uh, this bacteria absorbs all that nice rain, turns into a gelatinous mass and gets busy photosynthesizing, producing sugars, reproducing, and so on. So those, there we have the mycobiont, the fungal component and how fungus works. The phytobiont, in the form of algae and or bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria. Let's see how these things come together to form this lichen organism. Just like my background here, this is kind of a stylized cross section through a lichen organism where you've got those hyphal, hyphae, mycelium, remember all those words from fungus? We've got all the fungal strands forming the scaffolding, forming the body of the lichen, the fungus tissues being waterproof and yet um, allowing sunlight through and trapped inside in this kind of middle layer are the photobionts, either the algae and or bacteria in this green layer. Let me grab my fancy laser pointer. So this green layer represents that area of the lichen that is just right. It's close enough to the surface so that the sunlight can penetrate through these more loosely packed hyphae strands embedded in a nice thick body of hyphal strands, the fungus forming all this structure, attaching it to the surface where this organism is growing, presenting this layer of these photosynthetic organisms up to the sun to get them to work to make the sugars that feeds the fungus, right? The fungus keeps these things kind of held captive. Remember they can, they can live quite happily on their own, but the fungus takes these captive 
and holds them in this uh, cell, this, this jail, this prison of hyphal um, fibers and take the sugars from these photosynthetic organisms. Think of it, because I think of them all the time, think of it as like a peanut butter cup where we've got this nice fungus chocolate producing the body of the structure that you can hold on to. And inside would be the photosynthetic organisms, the algae and or the bacteria. So in cross section, a lichen is very like, maybe if you have an imagination, a peanut butter cup. And for years, this was the forever, this was understood. I mean, lichen have been taken apart by scientists. They've been studied and poked and prodded and figured out that we've got this fungus and we've got these photosynthetic actors at work in these, um, in these organizations that make these different species of lichen. But for some reason, in taking them all apart, they were finding that the same fungus and the same bacteria and the same algae, when they're put together, can produce several different species. And we weren't, scientists weren't quite sure what was going on there. Well, it turns out that there's a secret special guest star, a surprise guest star that only in 2016 was written about and kind of, you know, revealed to be a player in the structure and the biology of many lichen species. And that's the presence of a really weird fungus that lives on a couple of branches of the fungal family tree called yeast. Yeast is single cellular fungus. So they've become so specialized. They're not, they're not primitive. They're super, super specialized. They've gone from bringing these sprawling masses of hyphae down to single cells that reproduce by budding. And this is a close-up of yeast. And here it is making a little daughter cell. Still releasing digestive enzymes and reabsorbing. It's still a fungus. It just has this very simplified life cycle. And yeast is present. Different species of yeast from different groups of fungus are also present in lichenized um, organisms. And they can make the difference between how one species exists and how another. So if you have all these things stuck together from all these, from three different kingdoms of life, not just from, you know, you can't cross a whale with an ant. You can't cross, you know, one kind of fungus with another, much less can you cross a fungus with an azalea, right? We're talking about two separate kingdoms. So how on earth are we gonna reproduce this thing? Well, it has to do with basically taking cuttings. If you've ever taken a cutting, you're making a clone. You make a clone of whatever you take a cutting of. Getting good at cloning animals, don't know how I feel about that, doesn't matter. Lichen depend on cloning themselves in order to reproduce. And they make these little bundles, these little, little kind of hobo sacks of everything they need, little lunch boxes with everything they need to survive um, after they've run away from home with bits of the fungus, the hyphae wrapped around whatever the photosynthetic organism or organisms are that are occasionally released into the atmosphere like spores but they're more of a collection. They're a whole miniature Reese cup. They're a whole miniature peanut butter cup that gets sent out into the wind. And once they land, here's an electron um, microscopy picture of the photobiont or bionts 
encased in a few strands of that hyphae and they land on a suitable substrate, everybody starts to reproduce and grow. The hyphae grows, makes the network into the structure like you see in my background here. And th that particular species of um, lichen is cloned. They can all, they can erupt out of little holes in the surface that are specially created by the lichen uh, to, just to release these little sacks of, or these little parcels of everything they need um, in little depressions. Uh, lichen can also create little lumps that contain those ceridia, little lumps, and those lumps are called isidia if you need to know, but these are very fragile and just brushing these isidia off the surface and they might even catch wind um, and, and drift off and land someplace where they could reproduce or sorry, continue to grow. So those are two ways that they clone each other. And here we have um, not an electron but just our little in-house microscope. And you can see the kind of granular surface of this lichen, these little red patches, those are those little isidia that can catch the wind, drift off and grow into the same species somewhere else. So they can clone themselves. Obviously, lichen can result from a sexual, from sexual reproduction, from a bacteria, um, from a fungus, meeting another fungus, making a spore, throwing that spore out, growing, everything would have to be just right. The fungal spore would have to land right next to whatever blue-green algae, whatever green algae, and immediately grab it and become a lichenized organism. Remember, if the fungus in a lichen tries to reproduce itself and a, a, only a fungus spore gets released by that lichen, that fungus might germinate, but without its photobionts, it's not going anywhere. It's just gonna fizzle out and die. So let's take a look now at the diversity of this weird group of organisms. While the number of species is kind of in debate, we do know there's thousands. We'll just put it that way. There are thousands of species of lichen. So this event of fungus grabbing algae bacteria and existing and reproducing for so many millions of years uh, that has happened thousands of times. We're not going to go through all the thousands of species of lichen, but we are going to mention, and then turn you loose to go and look at these things, how they grow and how we classify them down to how they grow. Three growth forms that might not be too hard to remember. Three growth forms. Now, this has nothing to do with how they're related to each other. It can help in identification. These are how they grow. This is how they are seen out in the world. There are lichen that grow as crustose lichen. There are lichen that grow as foliose lichen. And there are lichen that grow as fruticose. And these all mean things, of course. And crustose means crusty. Um, these are the ones that are like paint. It's, um, it's, the pink, it's the pink staining on the branches of the trees out here in the preserve. It doesn't come off. It looks very much like paint. It's a crust. The folios, that means that it's, it, it's like leaves. So these are the ones that are kind of leafy leafy lichen, that's how they grow. And then there are the fruticose, and fruticose means shrub-like. So these are the ones that are actually more 
extremely three-dimensional. These are the ones that actually stand up off whatever surface they're growing on. And often these are terrestrial lichen. We often assume or associate lichen with growing on the surfaces, like on bark, on gravestones, on buildings or wherever. But sometimes the fruticose lichen can be found growing on the forest floor, just plop. Let's look at a couple of the crustose type lichen. Here's an example. This is one of the script lichen. And the orange color in the background, which is almost impossible except for the color to distinguish from the bark of this tree. It's growing so uh, oppressed to the tree bark that it's almost, like I said, except for the color, it's indistinguishable. The, the script, the weird, the writing, alien writing uh, that is scribbled throughout the body of this lichen, those are the areas where those um, diaspore, uh, the um, ceridia were be are being produced. So this one is undergoing some sort of reproduction. It's sending little bits of both or all fungus, yeast, bacteria, algae, all that, whatever it takes to reproduce the species, it is sending them out into the world uh, through these little scribbles. And it's what gives this group their name, the script lichen, an example of a crustose lichen. Another is our famous Christmas lichen or Baton Rouge, the crustos. Again, indistinguishable except for the color um, from the tree bark that it's growing on. Uh, Christmas lichen, also, also called Baton Rouge, uh, also called Cryptophicia, also called Herpethalon. Take your pick, call it whatever you want, call it pink lichen, suits us down. Just understand that this is this crazy association of fungus, bacteria, and algae, and yeast, all these things working together to make this almost impossible uh, organism called a lichen. Another script lichen, I didn't get a name for this one, just underscoring the point that uh, the profile of the crustose lichen is very, very, very low, um, almost one width whatever surface it's growing on. And remember, the body of a lichen is made of fungal tissue. So the fungus is using that hyphae, using that massive hyphae called mycelium, knitted together to produce just the right conditions for the photosynthetic organisms to, to live, uh, to be presented to the sun, uh, the fungal scaffolding can maintain a layer of moisture on the inside, can keep, you know, those photosynthetic organisms happy and, and not let them dry out, even though lichen are adapted to extreme environments. Because the fungus can withstand such extremes, the fungus can uh, grow into absolutely impenetrable uh, encasements to wait for conditions to get better and keep all those photosynthetic organisms alive on the inside. Lichen is found on every single continent, including Antarctica. Folios type lichen, if you'll remember, folios foliage, they have the same root, meaning the leafy. And these are quite easy to observe. There's no question. If you walk up to a tree trunk and you see the gray, wrinkly, leafy mass, you know you're looking at a folios lichen. And inside of that fungal matrix are the photosynthetic organisms that are making sugars that the fungus is eating, also releasing oxygen. So these photosynthetic organisms inside the lichen, just like any other photosynthetic organism, oxygen is a byproduct. 
So thank a lichen a little bit today for your for the air you breathe. Parmatrema is one of the genera of these ruffle lichen or shield lichen. And here we have Parmatrema up close here in our laboratory. Um, and you can see, remember way back when, when we talked about that one little subset of the kingdom of fungus, the cup fungus, the ascomycetes, here we can see even lichenized, even living as Parmatrema, the lichen organism Parmatrema with all the everything going on in there, the fungal component is still trying to express itself as just a fungus. And it's making that cup-shaped ascocarp. Remember that? With the ascospores? You don't have to remember that. But anyway, you know there's the cup fungus. Here it is trying to make one. Here is the fungus trying to reproduce itself all by itself. And good luck to it. It's going to produce a fungal spore. It's going to release that fungal spore. It's going to release a fungal spore that can't live unless it finds exactly the photobionts that it needs to recombine with to form another shield lichen. I don't know why this ruffle lichen, this parmatrema grows these little outgrowths. Locally, we call them eyelashes. They're not eyelashes. Um, they're just outgrowths of the cortex of this fun, uh, lichen. Don't know what they're for, but there they are. Helpful, helpful for identification, I suppose. Another one of the leafy folios lichens are uh, the parmelia, uh, the shield. They often grow in these very circular leafy um, component uh, organisms. Um, and you can see uh, this one is a little bit less gray and more green. So this one, you can kind of see through that top layer of the peanut butter cup fungus. You can kind of see through the top. You can see down into uh, the area where the photosynthetic organisms are being held captive, producing plenty of sugar for their captor the helpless fungus. And finally, the shrubby lichen, the fruticos. Fruticose just means shrubby. I can't think of another word that's derived um, with the same root as fruticose. It's just a word that exists in science. If, if something is shrub-like, it's fruticose. I don't know. What. Anyway, fruticose lichen. Here's a terrestrial example like I was mentioning before. This one's called deer moss. Uh, further, much further north, the same species or the same genus is called reindeer moss. Uh, we don't have reindeer here, so we call it deer moss. And yes, it does feed. In times of famine, um, it is good food. It is suitable food. It is famine food uh, for um, uh, larger animals, herbivores that live in very, very harsh climates where the lichen is just fine. All the reindeer have to do is dig through the snow, find a nice patch of cladonia and snack away. We have seen the deer around here at Brooker where there's plenty of food year round, eat the cladonia. As far as humans eating lichen, there is a, um, there is a tradition of certain species of lichen being eaten. Uh, just like um, certain species, of course, of the fungal components that that the that are lichenized. Uh, so yes, there are uh, certain lichen that in certain parts of the world are consumed, are eaten. No, I have never done it. One of our faves is uh, one called matchstick or British soldiers. And this is a fruticose lichen uh, that are kind of like little uh, like matchsticks, little upright, upstanding uh, lichen. And when it's time to reproduce it, it forms these uh, cute little red caps. 
uh, giving it its common name, the matchstick. Uh, the British soldiers, did they wear red hats? Did, I know they wore red coats, but did they wear hats? Anyway, some reason British soldiers uh, always looking for these when they're in their reproductive phase, but of course kind of nondescript the rest of the year. And beard lichen. Uh, this one looks very much like Spanish moss. Uh, it grows on the branches of trees. It's very three-dimensional. It's very grayish green, just like Spanish moss, but it is not Spanish moss is a flowering plant. Spanish moss is all its own thing. It's it's a one-off. It's just one thing. It's one plant. One it's a bromeliad. It has a tubular flower. It has a fruit. It has seeds. It has all those things. Whereas beard lichen is this weird mix: fungus, bacteria, algae, yeast. Some or all of the above. And again. Uh, occasionally during the year, even beard lichen produces these cup-shaped structures, and that is the um, the quote-unquote useless fungus trying to reproduce itself all on its own, and good luck to it. So that's a quick race through the biology of lichen, uh, a bit of vocabulary having to do with lichen. So let's get to some of your questions. Uh, hopefully you've got some questions, but first we're going to have a quick poll. Uh, Julia's going to launch a poll, and if you wouldn't mind, when I get a drink of water, just answering a few really quick questions. Your input is always, always, always very, very valuable. Uh, it's how we develop future programs and make our current programs even better. Thank you, everyone. We're going to leave the poll up for another 15 seconds and then we'll move on. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll get to some questions. Let me just give you a little bit more information. Join us next week for Woodpeckers. Woodpeckers 101, um, looking at one little group of a larger group of animals called the birds. Let's just tease, let's just take the woodpeckers out and learn them, shall we? Um, an interesting group, about five species that we have here in Pinellas County. We're gonna take a look at them. The following week, we'll do plant poison. People tend to love the macabre. So let's talk about deadly plants, why they're deadly. How do we know they're deadly? Um, if you missed part of, or if you'd like to share today's presentation, uh, it's going to be on our YouTube channel. So I'm about to sneeze, sorry. If you go and look for uh, UF IFAS extension, Pinellas County. I know that's a lot. Or Pinellas extension on YouTube. Any sort of permutation of Pinellas County extension, UF IFAS, yardy, yardy, yard. If you search for that on YouTube, uh, you'll find today's presentation, last week's, and some others that we've had, including uh, some fascinating uh, historical, like 500 million years at Brooker. That was quite good. Uh, Lara did common trees, and we've had birds through the seasons. And here's the epic two-hour life of a dead tree. Um, for more to keep up with us, uh, follow us on Facebook, the Brooker Creek Environmental Education Center. Um, should be easy enough to find. That's a low-tech uh, low ish way just by following us you'll keep up abreast of what's going on as far as our educational opportunities and if you have any questions just for me that you don't feel comfortable with 
uh, putting in the in the uh, chat or in the question. Anytime I'm here, it's my job. Um, my first initial and my last name at canalscounty.org, all one thing. Okay, so let's have a look at the questions and answers. Does fungus grow on trees? Absolutely. Fungus is found just about everywhere. Anywhere there's something that can be dissolved, fungus is there dissolving it, digesting it. So especially dead trees, um, uh, fungus, fungal mycelium have a propensity for getting up into dead trees and, and moving through. Uh, some fungus will grow on live trees. Some fungus will kill live trees in order for those live trees to then reduce themselves to what the fungus really likes which is the dead wood that it can spend the rest of its life cycle uh, digesting. Do the algal symbionts in, I assume in lichenized organisms, do they ever reproduce sexually? We haven't caught them in the act. I'll put it that way. Sexual reproduction when it comes to um, lichen, um, they're just that modest, I guess. It's just not been observed that many times. There are a handful of scientific papers that address this and posit how or if that may have occurred. Um, but as of yesterday afternoon, the last time I checked, literally, um, not much is known about that, the uh, sexual reproduction of these organisms once they're lichenized. Uh, it kind of bolsters the argument that the algae are prisoners or that the fungal component is actually a parasite on those organisms. Do you have any recommendations for further reading or research about lichens? I think our playlist on YouTube has been posted. Um, if you, I didn't give you your links. Yes, we, um, uh, we made a fact sheet. In fact, we, my boss and I wrote a little, wrote a little thing about like, and I was meant to post a link to that. Um, how about this? If you go to our YouTube channel, let me back up a little bit. Backing up to our YouTube channel and the Pinellas County Extension, Pinellas Extension, um, Pinellas Extension YouTube. Uh, there's a playlist called um, uh, Florida Supernature, and we'll put the link to the fact sheet in the lichen video that's recorded there. Um, we've got a couple of different resources. If you want to learn more, Sadly, there aren't that many books. Sadly, this isn't something that that many people want to sink their teeth into. Maybe y'all, one or more of y'all are going to be that person. Is lichen usually a shelter or do insects, it's gone. Insects eat any part of it. Um, lichen isn't known to be a a uh, primary food of anything. That's not to say that it doesn't get nibbled on here and there, but it doesn't provide enough whatever for it to be a primary food source. So yes, it does get nibbled. So again, it's, um, some insects do use lichen, however, as camouflage. There is a praying mantis native to central Florida here in Pinellas County. There is a praying mantis that is colored to look exactly like lichen. And so it is 100% camouflaged when it sits on the trunk of a tree waiting for something to walk by. 
and then it can catch it. So it uses it not only as camouflage as it uh, catches its prey, but it's also camouflaged against predators. Further information about lichen on websites, um, look up someone whose last name is Seavey, S-E-A-V-E-Y. Uh, CV has done a tremendous amount of work on lichen in Florida. Uh, his work is available online. Uh, in order to tell these things apart, in order to tell lichen species apart, it gets really heavy. Be ready. Um, you have to put chemicals, different chemicals on them and see what color they turn in the presence or absence of these chemicals. It's, it's nuts. It's wonderful. It's really good stuff. Um, but again, uh, if I don't think to send everybody who signed up today the links, um, I'll make a note and I'll send you some further links if you want to jump into the subject even further, which I certainly hope you would. I have a lot of folios lichen on uh, wooden benches that I want to scrape off. How can I keep it from coming back? What happens to the ones I scrape off? Should I leave them in the brush? So um, they're unsightly. Great. They're not doing any harm. They're not killing anything, but we just don't want them around. What do we do? Any fungicide, uh, I think uh, a copper, some sort of copper solution, uh, any fungicide is going to wipe out the lichen problem. So if you want to get rid of it, just treat it like it's a fungus. Uh, I, there might even be products that are made to uh, wash lichen off a surface. As far as not wanting it to come back, there's really not much you can do because the propagules are in the air. And just try and keep ahead of it. I hope that's a good enough answer. Um, but they're, again, they're not damaging anything, but if you don't like them, scrape them off. Uh, the little bits, yeah, if you if you have the stuff, I would rinse the brush really well because each one of those little uh, bits of the busted up lichen could very easily grow into a, a new organism, a new, that, that same species, but it would be like a cutting. How long will the lichen last when the branches fall to the ground and is there any way to preserve it? Good question. Um, one of the things that we impress on our visitors when we do give hikes and we talk about the lichen is that it's not harming the tree at all. It's just hanging out in the trying to be in the sun. Uh, if it were to harm its host, it would crash to the ground and die. Uh, how long it lasts depends on how much sun it's going to continue to receive once it's on the ground. If a lichen is lucky, and falls from a tree and lands face up, if you will, facing the sun. As long as nothing obscures that sunlight, it's gonna continue on and on and on. But as soon as it gets covered by further leaf litter, um, eventually the sunlight is gonna be shut off. That's gonna shut off the sugar factory that is that photosynthetic layer. Um, once that's dead, the fungus has nothing to eat and the whole organism kind of comes apart. Thank you. Does, yes, lichen can grow and does grow on stone, on rocks. Um, rock faces after uh, landslides, often the very first organisms to arrive would be lichen. And there's a whole uh, mythology around the creation of mountains and the presence of the bare rock and the lichen come and the lichen can adhere to that bare rock and continue to grow. And a byproduct of the growth of either and or the fungus photobiont um, can slowly kind of eat away slowly eat away at the rock, especially crumbly rocks like sandstone, to start to create the first semblance of soil. So the very first origins of certain soils are thought to be lichens, but we're talking yonks and yonks and yonks of time. This isn't a, a quick process, but yes, they can grow on stone. All the more underscoring the fact that they're not parasitizing whatever they grow on. Anything, does it grow under water? 
Not that we know of. That is one place where we, where um, lichen has not been found. Um, there are some that believe, um, scientists that have posited that it's very possible that some of the first organisms on land were lichen because we know that there were bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria available to be lichenized. We know that there were fungus on land. As soon as there was life, as soon as there was land, there was the photosynthetic bacteria, there was the fungus. It's entirely possible that there have been terrestrial lichen since there has been land and life at the same time. Can it hurt you? This is getting really deep here, man. Can it hurt you if it gets on your skin? No. There is a medical skin condition called lichen. So if you do choose to pursue lichen on Google, just be aware that there is a medical skin complaint that is called lichen. It is something else. But what we're talking about today, the stuff that grows outside that we can go and observe and appreciate and love um, is not that. I suppose we should, if lichen is not harmful to trees, Okay, this is a great question. Um, as I said, uh, lichen is not harmful to trees. Why does it seem that it mainly grows on dead trees? That's a great question. And it's part of the fuel that those people who want to take your money will tell you that stuff's killing your tree. You need me to spray it. Give me some money. What's happening is the tree is losing its vigor. The tree has lost its vigor. The tree has stopped growing for some other reason. Something has stressed this tree to such an extent that it just can't keep up with life anymore. We've all had these days, right? Just cannot keep up. But the lichen's fine. So the lichen just keeps on growing at its happy pace. It's out in the sun, it's getting everything it needs, it's got this, it's that. So the lichen just keeps growing. And so eventually it's gonna grow so much faster than this uh, compromised tree that it's going to appear as though the cause was the lichen. When in fact, again, once that tree does die and come crashing to the ground, that's it for the lichen. So no benefit could come to a lichen for harming the tree. Well, I really appreciate you all for your questions and for your attention today. We do hope that you will join us again next week as we explore the woodpeckers. If that's something that uh, floats your boat, uh, the week after uh, plant poison, there's plenty more that we're offering. We have our turtle series going on right now that's been very, very popular, extremely popular. So sign up and tune in early. And as always, follow us and keep up with us on our Facebook page, Burker Creek Environmental Education Center. Drop me an email. I'll be happy to answer questions. And thank you. And we will. Hopefully see you next week. Thanks again for joining us and have a great afternoon.